The following program is sponsored by friends and partners of Kingdom Connection. What I want to do in this message now is really stir up something in your heart that God has stirred up in my heart um, about this church and about our lives individually. I felt a nudge, a strong nudge in my heart to talk about the connection of fasting and, and worshiping and how that relates to you and I. David, who the scripture describes as a man after God's own heart. Listen, there are 10 chapters in the Bible that relate to the life of Abraham. There are 11 chapters in the Bible that relate to the life of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel and his kids became the children of Israel. We all know how important that is. And there were 11 chapters devoted primarily to the life of Jacob. There are 10 chapters that are devoted to Elijah and Elisha, the two major miracle ministries of the Old Testament. But there are 66 chapters in your Bible that relate directly, mostly, completely about the life of David. Over 1,200 references to his name are found in the Bible. And 59 times David is mentioned in the New Testament. When you think of faith, you think of Abraham. When you think of the law, you think of Moses. When you think of miracles, you think of Elijah and Elisha, the mighty miracles they performed. But when you think of praise and worship, we think of God's song and dance man, David. The most prominent Old Testament character mentioned over 1,200 times is a man of worship. That must be for a reason. There must be a reason why God kept talking about David over and over. It was because he loved the presence of the Lord. There are two scenes in David's life that we see. We see him cartwheeling, bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, and he's dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And then we see him on another occasion, on the saddest day of his life, when he has lost his family, lost everything that he possesses. His home has been burned with fire, and it looks like it's the end of his life. But what is amazing is in both situations, the happiest and the most devastating day of his life, his response and reaction was the, exactly the same. His first basic instinct was to worship. On his highest day or on his lowest day, his instinct said, you need to turn this into worship. The kingdom expanded and grew and prospered more under David than any other time in the history of the nation of Israel because he was a man of worship. Listen to me, businessman. Listen to me, person who has a vision for ministry, someone who may be even in a position or a pastor. I just said that the natural kingdom of the nation of Israel expanded, grew, and prospered more under David, who was a worshiper, whose main emphasis in life was to worship, it grew more under him than any other king. Wonder what would happen if while we're fasting and praying early in a new year, we would understand that as we worship God, he is, in a, he is, he is able to expand and grow and prosper our lives in our kingdom and his own kingdom like never before. Evangelism, listen carefully, comes out of worship. And this is what so many people don't understand, why we worship like we worship. We wanted to go a little longer this morning in worship. We wanted to clear the slate, so to speak, and break the routine. Because we understand in this church, it is a, it is a real pillar of this church, and always has been, that we be a church that is unashamed about our worship. Unashamed and uninhibited to give God boisterous amazing, sometimes loud and sometimes almost uncontrollable praise. You see, worship brings evangelism. People get saved when the church starts worshiping. It just begins to happen. 
It's amazing that Jesus one day said, I must go to Samaria. And when he got to the well, he said to his disciples, go get lunch and come back. And he sent them away. And there came a woman, a Samaritan woman of ill repute. Some say she was a prostitute. We don't know that, but we do know that she had been married five times and she was living with number six out of wedlock. And when Jesus talked to her, out of all of the things he could say to this lost woman, he began to talk to her about worship. He began to say, your father's worshiped in this mountain, but the hour's coming when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth, and the father will seek out those who worship him. Often we say, I'm seeking God, but when you begin to worship God, God says, I will seek you out. How many of you would like for God to seek you out today? How many of you would like for God to seek you out during the 21-day fast? He said, you can seek me and worship by fasting. Fasting, but when you begin to worship me, I'll seek you out. My presence will find you. That woman got caught on fire, set on fire spiritually after having a conversation with Jesus about worship. She ran back and the Bible said she brought the whole city. This is whole city evangelism, but it all began with a conversation about worship. The disciples came back and all they had was lunch, but she came back with every heathen in the city and, and, and she said, come see the man who told me everything and he talked to me about worship. The whole city can be saved when God finds a church that will worship him. The spirit of worship creates the spirit of evangelism. David wrote worship songs in the book of Psalms. And it's interesting that Jesus quoted more from the book of Psalms than any other Old Testament writer. More than Isaiah, Ezekiel, or the writings of Moses, he quoted more from David, and all he was quoting was worship songs. And yet Jesus said, my mission is to seek and save those who are lost. And the thing that he used, the tool that he used the most, the teaching that he used the most came from the book of worship, the book of Psalms, because he understood if I can get people to worship, then a worship will bring about evangelism. David wrote worship songs, and he praised God like no other. In the book of Acts chapter 15, there is a prophecy, and I want you to see it. He said in that same chapter, and after this I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and ruins. And when that happens, the rest of mankind will seek the Lord, even the Gentiles, the nations that don't know God. The tabernacle of David had to do with the fact that David brought the Ark of the Covenant, set it on Mount Zion under a tent, rolled the tent flaps up, up until that point, people had been banned from being in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was God's seat on earth. That's interesting. That, that, that God said, I will have a mercy seat because the Ark of the Covenant had something called the mercy seat. And it was God's seat on earth. That's why the Japanese, the ancient Japanese uh, interpret the scripture, God inhabits the praise of his people like this. Whenever people worship, God brings his big chair and sits down. In other words, God gets comfortable wherever a church begins to worship him. Don't you want to make God comfortable? Don't you want him to bring his big chair? Come on in, Jesus, and bring your lazy boy to free chapel. Get so comfortable here that you just kick your feet up. And you know what the seat is called? The mercy seat. Do you know why you get answers to prayer? Not because you fast. It's the mercy of God. Do you know why you get healed and get miracles and get blessed? Not because of any works that you can produce. It's the mercy of God. And he said, the way you get my big mercy seat in the middle of your blessing and your prayers and your congregation is when you worship me, you create a seat and I come down and sit in it. You create a lazy boy chair for God in your life. Let's welcome the presence of the Lord in this room, in the overflow, wherever you're watching me. Give him a seat in your house. Give him a seat in your business. And the more you praise him, the bigger that chair gets. <laughs> David said, I love the presence of God. So he rolled up the curtains. Up until that point, Gentiles were kept out. Women were in the court of the women. Most average people could never get near the ark. But he rolled up 
the curtain tents and he had musicians, 274 of them, surrounding the Ark of the Covenant in four different shifts, 24 hours a day, 365 days for 33 years. They played musical instruments nonstop, entertaining the presence of God on Mount Zion and the people could come and they could get into the presence of God. In 1 Chronicles 16, it says that Asa and his relatives left before the ark and they did not leave before the ark but ministered continually before the ark of the covenant. Do you know why we need so much worship and praise continually? Because Satan's opposition is continual. Revelation 12 and 10 said Satan accuses us before God day and night. In the book of Job, it says that Satan went in before the throne of God and accused Job before the throne and the angels. 24 hours a day, there's a demon somewhere accessing and accusing you before the throne of God. The devil knows how to get into God's presence. And if the devil's going to be there accusing, I'm going to be there praising. If the devil's is persistent enough to accuse day and night, I'd hate to think the devil is willing to go through more to get into the presence to accuse than I'm willing to go through to get into the presence and praise that everything he's accusing me of, the blood has already covered and I am forgiven and I am accepted and I am chosen and I am righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, if the devil doesn't let anything hinder him from getting in the presence of God to accuse. I mean, don't you know those angels despise seeing him coming, those that didn't fall when he was cast out of heaven. Don't you know they give him the royal cold treatment and eyeball him and he could care less. He walks right into the presence of God and accuses. But some of us can't even come to church and praise God and get in God's presence because they didn't sing my song. It's too hot. It's too cold. These people over here are getting on my nerves and I don't like this. You let everything discourage you. But you know there was a man who had 2,000 demons in the book of Mark and the Bible said as soon as he got in the presence of Jesus he fell at his feet and worshiped. Did you know nothing is authorized to stop your worship not even 2,000 demons can stop. Nothing can separate me. No trial, no burden, no x-ray, no bill, no setback. If I worship, I can get in God's presence. Nothing is authorized to stop your worship. Everybody take a praise break and glorify Jesus while you're fasting. I told them, I told them in the first service, I'm from North Carolina. And in eastern North Carolina, there's a military base where a lot of the big airline jets and, and F-16s and so on, they come uh, zipping in, uh, and it runs right parallel with an interstate highway. And they have a big billboard that the military has rented, billboard sign, and it says these words, Pardon all the noise. It's the sound of freedom. And I just want to say, if you're visiting during the 21-day fast, pardon all the noise, but this is the sound of freedom. He whom the Son sets free. Come on, you don't hear me. Is anybody free? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There ought to be a sound of freedom in our lives. The sound of praise is the sound of freedom. Just take a moment and give him a great praise in this room, in the overflow, wherever you're watching. Praise him. He'll get a chair, a mercy seat, and pull it up to your table. Hallelujah. Just take a moment. Clap your hands. Praise him. He set you free from cigarettes so you could clap. Oh, you don't smoke weed with those hands anymore. You clap them. You don't speak profanity with that mouth anymore. You praise him. You set your feet free to dance for him. He's worthy of that kind of praise. And I don't care what anybody thinks. This is who we are. I don't ever want my children to grow up in a dead, dry church. And if you like this, you better do this because all that happens is people quit doing it. 
Look over at somebody who looks like they need, a, they need something and say, God bless you. Now praise him. <laughs> do, do you know what the Bible said? Listen, look, look at me, look at me, look at me. The Bible said, weep with those that weep. But it's a command to rejoice with those that rejoice. Look down your row. If you see anybody rejoicing, you are commanded, whether you even know what they're praising for, join in. Rejoice with those that rejoice. That's even in the balcony. That's even in the overflow. If anybody around you is, I don't even have to know what you're shouting about. I'm just going to shout with you. Hallelujah. Rejoice with those who rejoice because when we praise, when praise starts getting out in the battle, we get breakthroughs. That's what happened to Jehoshaphat. God said after he fasted three days, quit worrying and go to praising. There's a connection to fasting and praising for this battle is not yours. It's the Lord's, but put the singers out on the front line. Put the singers out there first. When he consulted the people that they should sing to the Lord in the beauty of holiness, they went out before the army saying, praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. They had just come out of a fast. And the next thing the Bible said that when they started praising, the enemy turned on one another and devoured one another. And it took them three days to pick up the spoils of the battle. I need somebody to send up a praise in the middle of a 21 day fast. If you're believing God for great things. Oh, hallelujah. Get a praise phrase. Get a thank you, Jesus. Now look at your neighbor and say, you're commanded to praise with me if I rejoice. Now rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. Woo. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Huh. I'm almost through. Keep telling yourself that if you want to. <laughs> but I want to conclude with this. If we're going to praise Him forever, we better start practicing now. The Lord told me one time, there won't be any preachers in heaven, just worshipers. First Chronicles chapter 23 and verse 5, it said 4,000 were appointed to play the musical instruments. David said that I have made. He created musical, new sounds, new, new creative worship came to the temple. Musical instruments and sounds and rhythms they had never heard in God's house begin to invade God's house. Up until that point, the only musical instrument that they had in the tabernacle was the ram's horn, the shofar. <laughs> Boy, I can see those old timers. <laughs> That's my music. That's anointed music. But here comes David with new instruments that he has created. And they got rhythm and they got strings and they got all kinds. And, and, and I'm sure there were some blessed saints sitting that used to be in Moses' tabernacle. And now they're in David's tabernacle. And they're probably saying, bless God, if the ram's horn was good enough for Moses, it's good enough for me. But I just want to say to you that if you're saved and you've got children... Church isn't about you anymore. It's about your children and your children's children. And every generation has a sound. And every generation has their own style of music. And you may not like all. I don't even like it all. But you know what? I don't go by what I, I don't feel nothing when they do that kind of music. Now, when you get to playing your stuff, Pastor, when you start doing those old hymns, I feel... That's all you're saying. Nothing wrong with the old, nothing wrong with the new. Get into all of it. And you know what? I don't have to feel it. 
That's what I like about David. He danced before the Lord with all of his might. He loved God with all of his heart, but it started in his feet. Sometimes when you first start praising God, you don't feel it in your heart. That's what some of you, some of you just kind of sit there and, and, and you just look all the time. And, and if somebody were to ask you, why don't you praise God? You'd say, I don't feel nothing. Well, David understood that sometimes, you know, Jesus probably didn't feel like it when he was carrying the cross. He probably didn't feel like it when they were spitting him on, on, in his face and nailing him to a cross. He probably wasn't feeling it. has nothing to do with feeling, but here's what I've learned. A lot of times praise starts in my feet before it can get to my heart. I don't feel nothing in my heart, and I come in here sometimes, and then they got their music going, <laughs> 9 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> boom, bam, boom. I'm like, that's too much. I just need a coffee. <laughs> unplug it for 9 o'clock. Just unplug the whole thing. Give them an acoustic guitar and a harmonica, and let's, let's, let's go old school a little bit. That's a little much for the first song at 9 in the morning. <laughs> but here's what we're doing. You don't feel it in your heart, but it starts in your hands and in your feet. And if you get your hands to moving and get your feet to tapping and then get up off your blessed assurance and, and begin to praise God a little bit, move your body a little bit and kind of shift from one foot to the other and move it a little bit and just start rocking a little bit. And, just like you used to do rock with you all night. Just start doing that. Just start, just start, just start moving a little something. And you know what's amazing? It starts with the extremities, but it starts making its way. And before the thing's over, you're into it. Out of your heart comes thanksgiving and praise. Somebody give him a hand. Give him a foot. Give him a leg. Give him a mouth. Give him a tongue. Give him a praise. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. So I close with this. So David gets the Ark of the Covenant and he starts bringing it back. It's six miles from Obed-Edom's house where the Ark of the Covenant was to the temple that, or the tabernacle that he had built. A pace is two feet, two inches, and every six paces, he would stop. <laughs> he would take six steps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold it. He would build an altar, take an oxen, cut it, dress it, lay it on the altar, take a lamb, cut it, dress it, lay it on there, burn it up, worship God, send up incense, and as soon as that was finished, pick it up, Move forward. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold it. Stop again. Build another altar. Kill another. For six miles. 2,437 stops over six miles. 406 stops per mile. 2,437 oxen slain. 2,437 calves slain. If it took 30 minutes to prepare for the ritual sacrifice, that's 1,259 hours or 52 days to make a six-mile journey. Add eight hours of sleep, three hours to eat a day. That's 630 more hours, 26 more days to cover six miles. It took David 78 days just to move the ark from one place to the other, a distance of six miles. David was king. He had a lot of important things, everybody he needed to meet with. He's running a whole nation, but he says, there's nothing more important than entertaining the presence of God, and I must have his presence in my kingdom. And he worshiped for 78 days. David understood that he had some battles to fight and he only had one bullet. The bullet of worship. And with worship he soared and with worship he warred. And we go to battle with praise. We go to battle with worship. We war with worship. And when God arises, his enemies are scattered. When he stands up, when we worship, Praising God is an act of war. And if David, with one instrument, he could play the harp and the evil spirits that were in Saul would leave. 
If David with one heart could drive out every demon in Saul, what could happen with every one of our musicians and every one of us as we use our voice as an instrument to praise God? What could happen during a 21-day fast? Make the new year a year of increase, seeking God's best in 2015. Join Pastor Jensen Franklin and people from around the world for our annual 21-day fast, beginning January 4th, 2015. This month, we've prepared two special resources that will encourage you throughout your fasting journey. If this is your first fasting experience, request Fasting 101. In it, you'll find Jensen Franklin's New York Times best-selling book, Fasting along with devotionals and exclusive teachings on CD and DVD that will help you get the most out of your first fasting experience. If you've already begun to develop a lifestyle of fasting and prayer, there's Fasting 2.0 to take your fasting to another level. Included are resources that will lead to deeper intimacy with God and reveal advanced principles that will release the power of fasting in your life. Or for your gift of any amount this month, ask for Jensen Franklin's powerful CD series, Day by Day. Commit the new year to God through fasting and prayer and watch as He releases His hand of blessing and makes 2015 a year of increase. Register now for Forward Conference 2015 with special guests, Stephen Furtick, Beth Redman, Reggie Dabbs, Rich Wilkerson Jr., Banning Liebscher, Jensen Franklin, Lecrae, Elevation Worship, and Jesus Culture. For more information and special group rates, go online at forwardconference.org. is real, vivid, alive, beating, breathing. It happens behind closed doors and out in front. There's joy, there's laughter, and chaos. Lifelong friendships are forged, love is found, moments cherished, and never forgotten. Life is a gift. And together, we are real family. Real friends. Real people. Experiencing real life. This is Free Chapel. This program has been brought to you by the friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. For more information on this broadcast or for additional resources, go online at jensenfranklin.org.